Join us as we cover 10 board games that recently captured the attention of the Watch It Played team and discuss why each one caught our eye. These are games on our radar. Hello, again. <laughs> I'm Paula, and thanks for joining us to discuss the games that are on our radar this month. The clock is running, so let's begin with Monique and Naveen's first pick, Hickory Dickory, in which mischievous mice compete in a royal scavenger hunt inside a cuckoo clock. And the mice ride on the clock's minute hand as they search for items that match the hunt card that they hold. Jumping off the clock hand at just the right time allows players to collect item tiles and perform various actions that will help them gain victory points. We had the chance to play this at Dice Tower West, and for such an adorable theme, it is deceptively challenging. Every decision you have to make in the game that includes managing your mice, when to jump off the clock to take actions, and when to deliver your tiles is really, really tough, and it makes for a really interesting abstract puzzle. And challenging choices await in the first game that helped make this episode possible, Xylitar from Bezier Games. Embrace your inner polar bear musician. <laughs> We all have an inner polar bear musician in this inventive trick-taking game where each player's suits are public information and everyone's cards are laid out on the table face down, ordered low to high. So each player has a general idea of what's going on in everyone else's hand, but no one knows which numbers are where. The result requires observation and deduction as players take tricks and bid to earn extra points. The player who scores the highest has found the perfect balance of 80s synthesizer rock and modern karimba-style melodies and wins. Xylitar's release date has been moved up from August to June 19th, and you can follow the link in this video's description to pre-order it right now from Bezier Games. <laughs> up next is Rodney with the first of several games that made their way onto our collective radars during our trip to the Aircon gaming convention last month. This first particular pick is the card-driven Mamma Mia, first published back in 1998. So in game terms, it's ancient. Each player starts the game with eight different pizza orders to fill and a pile of ingredients, both represented by various cards. Each turn, a player adds one or more ingredient cards to a shared discard pile or optionally adds a pizza order card to that stack. After the draw pile is exhausted, the discard pile is flipped over and sorted by ingredients until an order comes up. If enough ingredient cards are available to fill that order, it's scored. After several rounds, the player who's filled the most orders wins. All right, I have to confess, I'm a thief, because this is totally a Matthew game that I stole. He taught this to Paula, Chaz, and I at Aircon, and I immediately ordered it after. So yes, I'm a pizza thief. But he stole my mushrooms in our game, so I make no apologies. Now, there are games that are quite simple like this, but they create very exciting moments of drama. And I put Strike in this category. That's a game where, effectively, you're just tossing dice into a bowl, according to some people. But I have played so many games of that that end in great moments of tension or players standing up around the table. And Mamma Mia is a small card game that gives you those kinds of moments where card flip by card flip, you feel the tension as players wait to see if their pizza order got enough ingredients, or if Paula took the last remaining pepper you needed just before your order came up. It's an older title, maybe not as easy to track down, but I did, and if it seems interesting to you, you might want to put this one on your radar. <laughs> My first pick of the month is also a game that I played last month at a convention, but <laughs> I've tricked you. I actually played it at Dice Tower West, which was several days before Aircon. You're quite the trickster. Thank you pizza thief. And now I'm also a game summary thief. As I mentioned that Paula's premier pick, The Search for Lost Species, is a successor of sorts to The Search for Planet X. But this time, instead of planets, thousands of plants and animals have been discovered, but haven't been seen for decades and could be on the brink of extinction. In order to save these species, we must find them again, and The Search for Lost Species embarks you on this real-world search. Locate the lost species and put them back on the map. So like I said, I played this at Dice Tower West with my friends Nick and Mike Murphy. Now Nick loves this game, and I don't feel like there's anything much better than getting to learn a game from someone who loves it, right? I really like deduction games, and I enjoyed this version of the game system a lot. I will be honest, when it comes to playing Search for Planet X, I'm never quite sure I'm doing it right. So I find the app for Search for Lost Species super helpful because it keeps me on track. 
And speaking of being on track, I am now reminded of our resident expert on not being quite right, Chaz, in his first game pick of the month, which is the Mystery Detective series. <laughs> and I think I nailed that segue. <coughs> In this party game all about solving mysterious events and happenstances, one player, the Chief, first selects one of the game's keeper-containing cards. Only the Chief sees the solution. The other players are detectives who, either separately or all together, conspire to crack the case by asking the Chief yes or no questions. One day, when I was in sixth grade, the entire class spent the whole afternoon trying to solve a puzzle that our teacher presented to us. It was thus. A man lives on the 20th floor of his building, and every morning, on his way out, he rides the elevator all the way down to the lobby. But then, when he returns in the afternoon, he takes the elevator just to the 10th floor, and then gets out and takes the stairs the rest of the way up to his apartment. Tell me, why does he do this? You're quite the trickster. Recently, I found myself in a situation where I wanted to share some of these types of brain teaser puzzles that we've all tried to solve from one time or another. Thus, I found Mystery Detective. <coughs> I found Mystery Detective to be the perfect opportunity to do just that. And... <laughs> so that's why this game is on my radar. Oh, if you are curious about the elevator thingy I just talked about, I will go post the solution to it in a pinned comment down in the comments. That's where the comments are. That's where one will be pinned with the solution. Next up is the first of two games that feature rioting royalty. The other game on Monique and Naveen's collective radar this month, Rebel Princess, in which stalwart sovereigns avoid marriage proposals in order to become the only single princess left. This is a trick-taking game, one where players actually have to avoid taking cards, the ones with a Prince Charming on it, because each of those brings a marriage proposal. The player with the fewest marriage proposals after five rounds will be the winner. We are both really big fans of trick-taking games, and this one is surprisingly thematic. Not taking Prince cards so you can avoid those proposals was actually really, really thematic in the game. And we also enjoy the fact that every round you start with a different rule, so it kind of spices up game to game. Matthew selected the other game on this month's list featuring a rebel princess, Star Wars Unlimited Spark of Rebellion, a fast-paced TCG that features iconic heroes like Princess Leia, the aforementioned rebel princess, get it? Villains, ships, and settings from all facets of the legendary Star Wars franchise, including movies, TV series, comics, video games, and everything in between. Paula, Rodney, Chaz, and I celebrated being all together at Aircon by playing sealed draft of Star Wars Unlimited. Star Wars Unlimited, Limited. And it was fantastic. This is a welcoming TCG that has deep and exciting gameplay and a weird cast of strange aliens whose names I'm annoyed I'm going to have to finally learn. Like Kino Loy? A perfect example. Or Lothar Rux? Yeah. Or Pong Krell? That guy, too. Only two of those three names are actual Star Wars characters. Also, I'm not sure I said any of them correctly. You're quite the trickster. Look, I can't keep all of those Star Wars names straight. I'm too busy keeping track of the three names that every Romulan has, as revealed in the episode of Star Trek Picard titled The Impossible Box, which is discovered that Romulans actually use three names. One used by their family, another being a unique name given to outsiders, and a third reserved only for those that they share a romantic attachment with. Huh, what an interesting concept. If I was to give myself a different name for when I'm among outsiders, I think it would be Erwin J. Supplefoot. You could call me Australian Super Spy. Jessica Kickface. Or maybe Farnsworth Q Fendercaster. Say hello to me. I'm Harump Barcelona. Or maybe Australian super spy Jessica Kickface. Oh, I'd be Giuseppe. I'd also be Giuseppe. Spelled a little differently. Oh, what, what's going on here? I get back from pinning a comment and suddenly everybody is somebody else. Oh, we're picking our Romulan names. Chaz, if you gave yourself a different name, what would it be? Gee, I never thought about doing that. But you know what I have been thinking about is the other game that helped make this episode possible, Horror on the Orient Express, the board game from Chaosium. A Call of Cthulhu's Horror on the Orient Express has long been an iconic and acclaimed tabletop role-playing horror campaign. And now a new board game adaption is coming from Chaosium in Horror on the Orient Express, the board game. The Orient Express is back in board game form. 
In this cooperative game, investigators try to survive a ride on the luxurious, yet doomed, Orient Express, while monsters attack the train and murderous cults hide among the passengers. Each character develops new skills as they gather items, talk to the passengers, discover clues, and ultimately decide the train's fate. Do you think that you have what it takes to stop the cultists from performing a hideous ritual and solve the dark secrets of the Orient Express before time runs out? Maybe. But you can find out for sure in a world of fantastical horror and adventure which is waiting for you from the authors of Nemesis, Frostpunk, and Destinies. Yeah, they help make all that stuff. So follow the link in this video's description to the game's Kickstarter page and reserve your ticket to ride the rails, prevent calamity, and <laughs> preserve your sanity. <laughs> I'm fine. <laughs> More games that we played at Aircon remain on our radar, including Marbunta, which requires taking control of a tiny battleground by leading a colony of ants. On a turn, the active player rolls six dice, then splits them into two groups. The opponent chooses and uses the dice in one of the groups, then the active player uses the remaining dice. The player's options all come down to a mechanism of dividing and sharing resources, just like real ants do in the wild when they play board games. After playing a bunch of games at Aircon, Marabunta stands out as the one that made me sit back and feel excited to play it again. It's a I split, you choose, dice rolling, war and right, in which little ants are faced with fantastic choices at every time. Matthew, what is a war and right game? Chaz wanted me to tell you what a war and right is, but I have no other examples other than this game. But essentially, we are fighting over territory, but that territory also happens to be one central dry erase and hill. Would you consider a war and right game to be anything like a flip and race game? Not really, no. More of a spin and flick? Not even close. Or Lothar Rux? I object. Sustained. All right then, case dismissed. <laughs> Buckle up, because Rodney's fancy has been struck by another historical game that caught his eye. And even though I said buckle up like that, it's not a Western. It's Amalfi Renaissance, an economic worker placement game that features a unique mechanism where ships provide actions and also manage your resources. The game takes place in Amalfi, an Italian port that was a dominant power during the Renaissance, but its importance diminished over the years. Kind of like Chaz. Amalfi was originally released in 2020, but now there's a new edition full of new mechanisms, characters, rebalanced rules, and more choices for replayability. I need to start by crediting Theo of the YouTube channel Geeky Gamer Guy for posting a picture of this game. I'll put a link in the description to his account if I remember, which we all know I won't, so someone watching please remind me, as is our adorable tradition. Now, my initial draw to this title was absolutely the art and presentation from the picture that Theo shared, but presentation only gets you so far. Kind of like Chaz. As I looked into the gameplay, I was intrigued by the concept that your workers, ships in this game, also play a double role as your resources. So while it has some of the trappings of other Euros, gaining and trading goods, it seems to have found its own unique way to do it and invites players to find ways to combo their actions to even greater effect, something I often enjoy in games like Castles of Burgundy. I'm very keen to try it, which is also why I ended up ordering a copy. <laughs> In a whimsical valley filled with magical sprites, you'll find Mythwind, the setting of a cooperative and solo cozy board game with unique characters that embark on an engaging story and an unending adventure. Although many players may find a natural end point to their game at the conclusion of the story, Mythwind has no distinct conclusion. Players can continue to play the game for as long as they would like over as many game sessions as they wish. Sounds like we're not stopping our game of myth win until I am definitely winning. It is no secret to anyone that I enjoy the opportunity for conniving and backstabbing that many negotiation games present. <laughs> oh, boy howdy. But Mythwind right here, well, not right here, just the top of the box because it is actually quite heavy and I am a wuss. But Mythwind caught my eye partially because it goes in the completely opposite direction of all that backstabbing and conniving. There's no pressure in this game to win at all, which honestly is a bit of a foreign concept to me, but that means there's no threat of losing either. 
This game is all about the experience, which that super intrigues me, even more than the opportunity to be a, a sneaky Pete would. Because in the end, it's the experiences that games leave us with that are the moments and the stories that we will carry with us long after the really heavy boxes and their lids are put away back on the shelf. And not for nothing, uh, but Mythwind, uh, not a sponsor, is also currently running a Kickstarter through the 19th to cover a reprint and some new content as well, which, you know, might be worth checking out if you're also interested in a game that you can enjoy by simply enjoying. <laughs> Paula's premiere pick this month is Wonder Bowling, a game that strikes a chord with her, with excitement to spare. A game that she's alley in for. I should have stopped whilst I was ahead with the first two puns. Regardless, Wonder Bowling is a dexterity party bowling game. But isn't regular bowling just a dexterity bowling party game? Regardless, regardless, in Wonder Bowling, the ball doesn't roll, it hits the lane and knocks down the pins with the vibration. The important thing here is to knock down a specific number of pins, because if you knock down all of the pins, it's a penalty. But again, if you only leave one, it's a strike. What's going on here? The rules of bowling have gone akimbo. Calm down, Harum for Barcelona. <laughs> because Wonder Bowling is just an action game designed to make you laugh, with no bowling experience required. Over a class two four axle commercial vehicle license is recommended. Could this be the perfect game? Got a small box? It's easy to travel with, it takes 30 seconds to teach, it's silly, it's got dexterity, it's fun. <coughs> okay, now that I say all those words, I think maybe it's just the perfect pub game. And it is, it is so good in a pub. I played this at Aircon and then immediately went and bought a copy and kept playing it after the show was over. In fact, I'm playing it right now. You might say this game really strikes a chord with me. Might say. I just said that exact thing a second ago. <laughs> With excitement to spare. Yeah, that's, that's literally verbatim what I just said. <laughs> ah, but you were smart enough to quit while you're ahead of the first two puns. Find even more. Pinspiration. <laughs> By continuing on to our viewers' choice video to discover which games are actually getting played by our viewers, be they new, old, or bizarre. Click here to join us there, and thanks for watching. Bye.